Hi, I'm Steve Adubato, and this is Lessons in Leadership. What is it about? Obviously, look at the title. It's leadership. Everything you've ever wanted or needed to know about leadership. Um, we thought of this show. When I say we, that's my colleague, Mary Gamba. You can see in the screen over there. Somehow she got her name in there. It's Lessons in Leadership with Mary Gamba, my co-host and colleague. Mary, tell folks. Now, this started as... A radio show with our partners at AM 970 in New York. Then we mm -hmm. said podcast. Now all of a sudden we're on video. I know. It was a crazy idea even to begin with 75 episodes ago when we started the idea of doing the radio show. And then we said, wait a second, we've got something here. Why don't we just take it and do a little bit more and put it on video? That's right. And by the way, we'll introduce our colleague Elise Glennon from the New Jersey Sharing Network in just a minute. But you know what's so fascinating to me is that what we try to deal with is very practical leadership issues. And the fact that we're in this studio here at East Main Media Studios is not an accident. The fact is, one of the themes that we push very often in the coaching that I do, I do coaching and, and seminars and a whole range of work, including this won't be the last time this happens. This book called Lessons in Leadership by Steve Adubato is innovation. And the whole idea of going on video and being able to have a video platform for potential broadcasts at a later point, not an accident. Correct. And I think really when we started talking about the need for not only listeners, but also viewers to understand the importance of leadership and how it works in all aspects of life, it just was a natural fit. It is. By the way, let's introduce Elise Glennick. Get Elise on camera. Elise, here's the thing, because it's fascinating. I'm going to make this transition. A big theme that we have when we talk about leadership is teamwork. Now, first, describe your organization, the role of teamwork in what you're doing and saving lives. And then we'll connect it back to the teamwork that it took for us to be here today. Go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for having me here, Steve. You know what? Organ donation and transplant, like you said, does not happen without teamwork. So at New Jersey Sharing Network, we're responsible for organ recovery for transplant across the state. And in order to make a transplant happen, it requires the teamwork of our entire organization. Who's on that team? Break it down. From our transplant coordinators to the folks in our call center, to the people at the hospitals who are helping to identify potential organ donors, all the way through our family services team who are there to support families in their time of need when they're losing a loved one, and then kind of cross over to the other side, the team waiting at the transplant center for the organs to support the transplant recipient and their families. Additionally, you have our entire public affairs team who is trying to educate the community so that they don't first hear about organ donation in the hospital when their loved one passes away. So it requires so many different people, so many moving parts, and certainly a lot of teamwork. And when Elise talks about the public awareness, the public communication about it, we are partners at our not-for-profit company, the Caucus Educational Corporation. For several years now, we've been promoting doing public awareness around organ and tissue donation. That information will be up on the site right now. But real quick, before I go to Brian Brodeur here at East Main Media, things go wrong. Inevitably. Now, we're trying to build a studio. I say we. I didn't do anything. <laughs> they did it. They're trying yeah, to build a studio. You were here yesterday with your hammers and nails putting up the walls. Mary, that name can come down very <laughs> quick. Trust me. Um, but the whole idea is this. It does take a team. Things go wrong. But if things go wrong when you're trying to build a studio for a, a podcast radio show that's going on television, okay, you deal with it. I'm thinking things go wrong in organ and tissue donation, life-saving Margin of error, not the same? Right, not the same at all. The work that our clinical team does is so critical, and it needs to be right every time. Something goes wrong along the way, you lose potential organs, and people on the transplant waiting list don't make it. Our teams are incredibly trained, incredibly compassionate people, very dedicated to the work, and they really just don't stop. We operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the support teams behind them are important too. Your mm. basic support teams, finance, IT, you know, if, if the computers go down, so to do the medical records. But real quick so on that, all sorry for interrupting, we talk about listenership in another segment, but here's the thing. I imagine the communication has to be more precise more direct, more specific, more concise, more timely, more everything. Yeah. The clinical teams are obviously, obviously everybody has a phone, but 
every single minute of a potential organ donor case is communicated with the teams that are on call that day mm. in every moment because every decision is critical. We do have administrators on call every day who are involved in every decision. And it's not linear. You can't say, well, you know, if this happens, then you're supposed to do this. And if this happens, because every person is different, every medical situation is different, and you need leaders in that area. When you talk about leadership, our administrators on call are the type of leaders that have to make split decisions. They have to be able to process information very quickly. Typically, any case is not like anyone before. Are so they you all have leaders? to have instincts. You I'm sorry for Are they all leaders? I would say they are. Our clinical so teams, one. they all have to be. There's not they one how I'm the quarterback, I'm the leader. Uh, it's not that. Well, technically, there is one quarterback, the administrator on call. In title. Makes, in title, yeah. But in reality, yeah. everyone's a leader. They have to be. They have to be able to think quick. And I think that's such a key component of being a leader is having that instinct. So watch this transition from saving lives to building a studio. So Brian Brodeur here at East Main Media, let me ask you, you and your team, I would say about a month or so ago, if I'm not mistaken, we started talking about the possibility of doing this. You know, there's some interest in, on some broadcast, when I say broadcast, outside of radio and our podcast. And by the way, Mary, tell folks how they can get to us. <laughs> sure, absolutely. There's a lot of different ways that people can find us. First and foremost, if they want to follow us on Twitter and on Facebook, they can do so at Steve Adubato, PhD, A-D-U-B-A-T-O, for those listening on radio. And they can also subscribe on Apple Podcast as well as on Google Play. And also, as always, we have a bunch of free resources on our website, which is stand-deliver.com. We have free articles, more information, and links to all of our past podcasts as well. Got it. Brian, back to you. Several weeks ago, mm -hmm. we said, hey, there's a possibility we could do this. What did it take? And you're going to leave out a lot of details because the reality is we'll never know. <laughs> you get a challenge like that, an opportunity like that. You say what to your team about, hey, we have to build a studio pretty darn quickly in order to get this done. Go ahead. Well, you trust in the team, right? I couldn't confidently move forward supporting an effort like this, what we're doing, or anything, unless I had 110% confidence in the team. And, you know, our operation here is both post-production and obviously production here. And I have to know that we're going to execute. And that's number one. And once you have that in place, you move forward and you make it happen. And, and one, I was going to jump in. One thing that was really interesting, and Brian, I think mm -hmm. you're leaving out an important part. You didn't say, oh, maybe we'll get this done. <laughs> it was, we are going to get this done. And regardless of what that took from start to finish, whether it was staying here probably until after midnight last night, getting mm -hmm. all the walls situated, but the process, it was never a question of if, it was just a question of, I will get this done. And that also is a great communication and leadership attribute because it gave confidence to us that it will be done. We knew it was going to be done. So Well, that demonstrates your trust in us, which mm -hmm. we appreciate. Thank no, you. No, we're praying a lot too, but go ahead. <laughs> well, so is I. <laughs> the walls could fall down at any moment. Um, you mean that facetiously. I just want to be clear. <laughs> uh, yes, they are very secure. Don't worry. Uh, you know, think of it this way. If I wasn't confident in pulling this off and I said yes anyway, that's a huge risk because that puts your operation at risk. And I can't do that as a producer and, and with you as my client. So it all works together. You know, it's the partnership with you and the teamwork and, and again, the confidence with JP and Andrew and Kayla and everybody. Yeah, you know, it's interesting about that. We have certain props around here. And by the way, the books are absolutely real here. They're all kinds of leadership books that I've been collecting for my seminars and, and workshops and coaching. But I also have some signs here. This is simply, think about what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Just make it happen. I know we're not, Nike's is just do it. Just make it happen. But here's the thing. Isn't it easy to say, quote, make it happen, building a studio, saving lives, organ and tissue donation, but what happens to a leader or for a leader and his or her team when frankly, I often think about this, I was coaching a client the other day and he said, Steve, sometimes I'd lose confidence and my team then lose confidence in me. And I, all I could think to coach him was, I said, look, Bob, fake it. He said, what do you mean fake it? He said, but I'm not confident. I said, listen to me. If your team smells that you're not confident, even if you're not really confident, it has a trickle down effect and it's not positive. At least, how do you deal with the fact that you're not 100% confident? Tell folks about the huge event, couple events you have, like the big walk every year, the walk run, right? Which is? 
which is our 5K celebration of life in How May many and people? June. Yeah, we get about 10, 12,000 people across the two events. Yeah, just a few. Yeah. And we've covered it every year. But here's my point. How hard is it to act confident where you don't feel confident as a leader? I know exactly what you're saying. And I, and I totally agree with that. I totally agree that leaders of any organization have to maintain the calm and the it will happen. We're going to make it happen. It's going to happen. Yet, you know, something might go wrong, but we have to maintain that forward look and and I hope my team's not watching, so they don't know you're telling me to be. <laughs> so, you're talking about is it like big? the Mary? Let me get this right. The analogy. Uh, so on the lake, I always get this wrong. So who's paddling on the lake? The the the, the duck. Are you talking about the duck, duck on the yeah okay, on the top? What does top? the duck looks, look like on the top of the water? He looks perfectly calm, like everything's just okay, and he's slowly gliding on the top of the water and what underneath the surface. Underneath? His little feet are going super duper right, duper right. fast, and that's a great analogy. You don't want to yeah. see them. No, you no. You don't want your yeah. team to see you know, those feet. I have to tell you, I was on an airplane last week, and the pilot said something. Oh, no. Oh, no. Tell the <laughs> and I looked, I actually looked at the person I was traveling with, and I said, that was the wrong words to use. We were waiting for the plane to take off, and the pilot commented that his co-pilot hadn't arrived yet. That's why we were delayed. But what he said was, instead of just saying, we're going to be a little delayed, the co-pilot's on his way, and then we'll get going, you know, like confidently. He said something like, I don't know what happened to my co-pilot, but he's on his way. And, and it made me feel <laughs> like, well, was the co-pilot having an extra drink? Like, what was yeah, happening? Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I always like to use the pilot analogy, because when it's turbulent, the pilot just has to say, just put your seatbelts on, we're getting there, no problem. You know, you hear any fear in that pilot's voice, it evokes mm -hmm. fear But at least what happens else. if he doesn't really know where the co-pilot is? He should fake it. He shouldn't so tell us. He should not. I, I mean, to me, the tone of his voice and his unknowing, you know, yeah. the pilot should know everything. So I, I thought he didn't, he could have held that back. Yes, Mary Gamma. I was just going to say for those listening on radio, I just want to make sure they know who they're listening to. Oh, and I'm that's, sorry. I just, that's okay. I, I apologize. We've been <laughs> we in the show for it. 10 minutes. I've, Elise it's, Glennon, go ahead, mm -hmm, Mary. Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer, NJ Sharing Network, and the Executive Director of the NJ Sharing Network Foundation. So just for those listening on radio I think that was important because thank you Mary speaking about innovation speaking about one of our themes is I got these things never never give up falling down as part of life blah 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 oh, that's a good one. but I'll tell, mm -hmm. how about this one the status quo the status quo is never what? an option oh, never an option yep the status quo is not an option for the sharing network which means that in 2020 the status quo will not be the case go ahead Right. So for you mentioned the 5K celebration of yes. life. We feel you know, a few years ago, we felt like we kind of maxed out on that. It plateaued. It's a huge event that we do every year. And kind of what's next, what you just said. We can't just keep going in that Innovate regard. Innovate or die. So, yeah. So we decided to bid on the Transplant Games of America which is an Olympic-style six-day festival for transplant recipients and donor families and living donors all come together to show the world that And it's like thousands works. of people, right? I mean, thousands and thousands. Thousands and thousands. I mean, we figure we get 10,000 people to our walk just from New Jersey. This is an international event coming to New Jersey. And we're looking at maybe 20,000. We don't know. This event travels around the country every two years and has mm -hmm. never been in a market such mm -hmm. as ours. So when it was in Salt Lake City, there were about 8,000 people over the course of the week. So we anticipate double or triple. But again, we don't really have anything to go on on that other than the great support we've been getting from the state of New Jersey, from the community, from our corporate partners. But we did that because like you just, whatever quote you just said about the status quo. It's I, never an I, option. It's never an option. So we bid on the games and, and we won. And, and we talked about teamwork before that, even just the bid process required incredible teamwork. We couldn't do it alone as the sharing network. We really leaned on support from, right. from our partners, RWJ Barnabas Health, Hackensack Meridian Health, American Dream, the Meadowlands Chamber and Convention and Visitors Bureau. We came together as a team and showed a very strong front to the transplant games. You know, again, you may think the books are a prop. They are not. This one I think about a lot mm -hmm. because relationships, to me, our relationship with East Main Media, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for that relationship, right? Right. What's the title of that book, Steve? Relationships. John Maxwell is big, but it says relationships. It's a yeah, small book. Relationships 101. Relationships 101. Check it out. By the way, we're going to have on our website our list of lessons in leadership, the leadership library, if you will. But the reason I'm thinking about this is you talk about your relationship with us. But then you talk about your relationship with these healthcare organizations, 
you know, Hackensack Meridian Health, RWJ Barnabas Health, others that we have relationships with as well. Leadership is about day-to-day -day building strong, trusting relationships. There's no book, whether it's from John Maxwell or anyone else, you go, oh, those are the four things I need to do in a relationship, correct? So if you were doing a seminar on relationship building, what would be the keys? Oh, I would say be genuine. That would probably be number one. I think, you know, for me in building the relationships specifically around bidding on the transplant games was because I believed in the transplant games. I believe that bringing an international event of your that. Your passion. Yeah. Passion so matters. If you're passionate about it, and then you can be genuine about your cause when you're building the relationships. The relationships for the bid went far beyond those partners. We had, I don't, I don't remember, 20 or 30 letters of support, including one from you as well. So, Hope it didn't hurt, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think about the calls that we made to say, if we do this, will you support it? And the letters that people wrote in support of that were not just from a single phone call. It was from years of relationship building and relationship making. So I would say be genuine and be patient because it's not transactional. I've done sales seminars where people say, I got to close the deal. Mm -hmm. Transactional. I know you have to close the deal. But if the other person perceives, this is at least my view, if the other person perceives that all you're really about is being, quote, transactional and closing a deal, what's in it for them? And so transparent. When that you think I don't that, know that you're trying you know, to sell me, right? Go ahead, right? It's so transparent. I mean, it to me, it's so long term in our business in organ donation. It used to be years ago, 10, 20 years ago, we just wanted to get people to sign the donor registry. That's it. So if I was at a table display at a health fair and you came up and I said, become an organ donor, and you said, oh, I'm already registered, and you showed me your license, I'd say, thank you, nice to meet you. That you would know, be move it. on. So now, I mean, this is a very simple example, but now if you came up to the table and said, I'm a registered organ donor, I'd say, that's so great. Welcome to the family. Give us your, uh, you know, information. Come to our events so that we could build a relationship with you so that you then want to continue to advocate for us beyond just your donor registry. So sure. uh, we talk about that a lot, that it's it's no longer a transactional relationship, just about check the box and, and move on. We want to build relationships because maybe 10 years later, we're going to bid on the transplant games and we want it's your true. support. You know? It's You know what, Mary, you and, I, you and I talk about this a lot. We're going to take a break in just a second. Building relationships at least to me and, and our company. Mary and I, just if you're watching us for the first time on video, Mary and I have been working together for 19 years. We have a great partnership and a collaboration with our company, Stand and Deliver. It not only produces this product together with East Main Media, but we do seminars, workshops, five books in now on leadership and communication. None of that would have happened without this young lady right here. But people often say, oh, Steve, you build great relationships with people. And, I, and I'll say, have you met Mary Gamba? And the answer is yes. What I mean by that is, often quote behind the scenes, mm -hmm. you are strengthening those relationships at the core. Make Absolutely. it clear to folks. Because some folks might say, well, I'm not the CEO. I'm not out front. I'm not the head of the, by the way, Joe Roth is the CEO as we speak, as we're talking about this right now, but at least as a top executive in the organization, mm -hmm. heads the foundation, you don't have to be the top, top. You don't need to be the top, top. And oftentimes you are out doing what you do best and I'm behind the scenes doing what I do best, which is simply, we always talk about caring that you can't teach caring. And I genuinely do care about every single person that we connect with on a regular basis. And if that means understanding what they're going through personally, maybe they have a family member that's sick, maybe they just got married, just doing that extra little touch, whether it's sending a note, sending an email, just saying thank you, or just saying, hey, we're here. We haven't spoken in a while. Those types of things. I learn from you and, and also with through writing the books together and being a lifelong learner. And that's really just key to building those relationships. It isn't like I have a list of people and say, I'm going to go and I'm going to build relationships with Bob and Linda and Karen. Check today. off the box is mm -hmm. not the way you build relationships. We have a client and a friend, a really good friend who's going into surgery literally mm -hmm. tomorrow as we speak. Yep. And you and I talked last night mm -hmm. and it's not, Hey, look at us. It was we do a lot of business with them. Yep. She's a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. She's close to us. And we wanted to make sure she knew we were thinking about yeah. her. And a perfect example, you would share that with me. I had already heard about it just earlier that day. Which probably. I didn't know you knew. Go exactly. Ahead. And at that point, I had already sent a note and said, hey, thinking about you, let you know. And of course, there's nothing that I can do. But just letting them know that you care and that you're thinking about them sometimes is, you know, really all they need at that moment. Final point on this before we let Elise go. Is leadership, in your view... Given the way Mary and I have been talking about this, given how many late night conversations not only I have with Mary, but with Brian as well, that he's like, is he calling again? What do we have to deal with? 
we communicate sometimes off business hours. We're there for each other and we deal with difficult times together. Is leadership on some level very personal? As opposed to in The Godfather, one of my favorite books, it's here somewhere. There's a great quote where Sonny's trying to teach Michael, his younger brother, about something and Michael's very upset, which is ironic because Sonny's the hothead and he goes, it's not personal. This is just business. This is nothing personal. Is it personal yeah. or business <clears throat> or both? I think it's definitely both. And it's very organic and it depends on the people. It depends on the circumstance. You said it before, there's not a textbook <laughs> way to do this. And, you know, every individual is different. Mary just talked about it. Everybody's circumstance is different day to day. And it's, it's organic. You have to kind of go with the flow. I think one of the the most frustrating things I get asked from like marketing firms that we work with is, what's the ask? What's we need the to have the <laughs> ask. And I'm like, I, it depends. The ask depends. You know, if On I'm what? at a networking, like yesterday I was at a, a networking event. Right. I'm not walking around the room saying I have a specific ask Here's of anybody. Here's my card. Can we have your organ? Right. That's, exactly. That's not exactly. a great ask. No, it's, it's a casual, a organic slogan, conversation. Right. It could be. <laughs> but um, is each and, person have a different circumstance? And that's why the ask, if you will, is different is based different. on the situation. Right. So I just speak my truth. Hey, what, you know, what do you do? Here's what I do. And then the person will say either in yesterday's case, real stories, tell me their entire life story about how they became a bone marrow donor. Someone else shared with me that his brother-in-law, when he passed away, donated his cornea. I didn't ask, do you have a connection? Do you have this? What is your, you know, what do you want to do? Because people want to get involved with us in different ways. They may want to be an organ donor. They may work for a company who wants to sponsor the transplant game. So it's not an ask. It's how can we help you fulfill your philanthropic mm -hmm. goals. It's not just one-sided. It, it's also, it has excuse to be me, not about the, Mary, one of our chapters in Lessons in Leadership, which is about empathy. You know the tagline? Mm. It's all about? All about them. It's all about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly them. what I was just trying to say. But exactly. it is. It's all about that's them. Exactly because when it. we think it's all about yes. our stuff, got to sell our stuff, got to no, sell no. books, got to get this podcast out there, got to... Okay, we know you have to do that. Right, and especially mm -hmm. with organ donation, when you're that person going into a room of a family member who is making that really challenging decision, having that level of empathy, and of course you can't really know what they feel like and what they're going no. through, because again, everyone's unique, but empathizing is all about just putting yourself in that person's shoes mm -hmm. and how would I want to be spoken to in that situation, because right. it right. must be super challenging. And by the way, before we let Elise go, what you've been promising to do for 10 minutes, but that's what happens when you get into a very interesting conversation here, is that Elise's personal story, she'll only share so much, but I remember meeting your husband and he had right come off the Today Show, he had been doing the Today Show and not just to do the Today Show, real quick. He did it because he decided to donate his kidney to a stranger and be the leader, the first person in a kidney chain that is still going on two years later. The kidney chain has several people involved. Go and ahead. he donated to a stranger, and that stranger's daughter donated to a different stranger because they were not a match. And so that chain has continued. He just had his two-year checkup yesterday. He's doing very, very well. But obviously, that's a sense of leadership as well. And that's after personal. the Today Show, he was getting contacted from all over the country on people finding him on Facebook, asking to speak with him about his experience. Wow. And he had two choices. He could have ignored those and just gone about, you know, he did his donation. He doesn't have to do anything else. He oh, saved yes. someone's life. That's it. But he chose to continue to pay that forward and take a leadership role in that. And he talks to anyone and everyone who calls him who's either in need of a kidney or considering being a, a living donor themselves. Well said. By the way, I'll stop with the props in a second. Mary, you can't see what this says. Not yet. No. Actually, pay it forward. I do pay have very forward. good vision. Mm -hmm. You know, th listen. The other thing I use very often, because I screw up, leaders screw up very often, but some of them, whether in Washington or Trenton or Albany, regardless of where you're watching us, or corporate America, what you never hear when people screw up is this. Sorry! Sorry! Mary's like, you actually did that. I, I'm just amazed by the amount of, um, this is our first show, and the <laughs> fact that you have that much going on oh, right oh. now at your station is fantastic. It I seems can only like imagine. Mary, it seems like Mary just implied, because it's our first show, excuse what Steve is doing right now. <laughs> but uh, I'm realizing I need a lot more props. So. Yeah, but I also don't think you realize that your annual performance review with pay and bonus I is coming up in a couple well weeks. well aware, yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, Elise Glenn, I'm going to thank you so much for the Sherry Network uh, Transplant Game coming up when and where again? July 2020. Where? Uh, in the Meadowlands area. American Dream, Prudential Center, NJ Pack, MetLife Stadium, and a bunch of other venues throughout. Well done. 
You are a great leader. Say hello to our partner and friend, your colleague, Joe Roth. I will, absolutely. So this is Lessons in Leadership with Steve Adubato and Mary Gamber. We're coming to you again, our partners and colleagues at East Main Media Studios. Our initial broadcast on the television side, on the video side. We thank you for watching. We'll be right back. I promise, right? We're going yeah, to break? We're right after this. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've ever done this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato with my colleague and co-host, Mary Gamba. Mary, that was a fascinating conversation with Elise Glennon. It always is. Elise, and we didn't mention this before, but she's also on our board of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Sure important is. to note. And she's just amazing. And to literally say that you are saving lives, it's so inspiring. And to be able to lead that effort, it's just always great to hear her share her stories. You know, it's funny. She was talking about partners who make things happen, whether it's mm -hmm. with the transplant games or wherever it yep. is. And I just want to make sure that folks know that the only way we are here, other than our colleagues mm -hmm. at East Main Media Studios who have made this happen, built all this in just a few days, frankly, we have folks, our sponsors, the folks who support us every day, New Jersey Resources, uh, RWJ Barnabas Health, Hackensack Meridian Health, mm -hmm. and a range of others. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also Gibbons. I'm even going to go to my cheat sheet because I can do that. And what about Valley? I was just looking at Valley. You saw where my eyes were going. We've got NJIT, which is a wonderful partner of ours. In addition to the NJ Sharing Network, we were just listening sure. to Elise as sure. well. And the list goes on, PSE and G. And then we have the Russ Berry Foundation, also a really great nonprofit. And as we do this series, we'll continue to promote all yeah. of our other great friends. And the reason is we want to say thank you. Because exactly. Mary and I are big on the idea of gratitude and appreciation and simply saying thank you. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple other things. Again, I don't like props that are not used. It's like, oh, it's just a prop. What are you doing with that? But this is one that's interesting. Mary said she liked this. You see this one? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you see it on camera. Tell everybody yeah. what it says. It says, falling down is part of life. Getting back up is living. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I have another one. I always say it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. It's just that you get back up again. That's the most important thing. But what, it, it's the same. Well, then what about people who say, I can't? It's funny that you say that. A long time ago, I made it a point to not put can't in my vocabulary. Really? It, yes. It is a word. It's a horrible word because it means that you're not willing to try. And even try, I try not to use too much. I I'll usually, try to get it done. I'll try to get it done. Which is not the same as the other one we had. Where is it? Uh, make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, how how effective it would this be if it said, I will try to mm -hmm. make it happen? Yeah. That's not leadership. Well, it's a cop out. It is one of those situations where it's a lot easier to say all the reasons to make excuses. And we deal with leaders all the time through our firm, Stand and Deliver, where they say all the reasons why they can't do something. I can't get that done in time. I won't be able to do this. And instead, if you see it as an opportunity to say, I will get it done, you will get it done. And again, just looking at this great studio, Brian and his team at East Main Media said, we're going to get this done for you. And they got it done. But they could easily have said, mm -hmm. it would have been fair for Brian and his team to have said, and by the way, you hear this from contractors and plumbers mm -hmm. and carpenters and people outside of that particular oh, yeah. world all the time. They'll say, you know, I can't make any promises, but we're going to do our best. Now, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, my wife and I, Jennifer, have this conversation all the time because she's an entrepreneur in business and she'll say, yeah, I'm going to try to get that done. Or, I go, oh, Jen, to me, mm -hmm. I believe you have to say, we'll get that done, even if you're not sure how right. to get it done. Now, or, she always gets it done. Right. But my thing is to say you're going to get it done. Say you're going to get it done. And the other thing that I hate is if they under promise and then they say that they're over delivering airlines for instance oh they tell you hey we're going to get you there at 3 30 and then you end up leaving a half hour later but somehow you got there at 3 15 and they're like woo look at us it's because they pat on time i mean no offense to the airlines but it's they not like you cut. expectations they lower expectations strategically. strategically and there's people that do that in business and you're doing a disservice you should say what it is when you're going to get it done and then do everything in your and of course things are going to happen right where you don't get it done sure but you just really need to commit to what it is that's going to happen. The other thing, we have a, about three minutes left. I want to let folks know that in this Lessons in Leadership podcast, radio show, what's often interesting to me is that so much of what we talk about, when we talk about leadership, people say, well, you're going to build a whole thing around leadership. Well, the reality is the word leadership could be replaced with the word life. Yeah. 
I can't think of one aspect of leadership, whether it's being a good listener, as mm -hmm. I was interrupting, and you reminded me before, falling down and getting back up. That little sign right yep. there, tell folks yep. what it is. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And as we always say, be comfortable with being, get, uncomfortable. being uncomfortable. Well, someone says, I'm uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah then you're not going to grow. Meaning exactly. I get that you're uncomfortable. We all are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But if we won't try to work through it right. and learn to get comfortable being uncomfortable, is that really just about leadership or is that about life? Oh, absolutely. And oftentimes the things that scare us the most are the ones that are most worthwhile. So whether it's something it may be, oh, I, I want to go and get my master's degree. Well, it's super scary. Do I have enough time? You could think of a million reasons why it can't happen. I got the kids. I have all I got these the responsibilities. Kids. I've I got can't this. do it. I, got I can't. That. And it's scary. Or it could be totally making a career change. How many times do we deal with people that are literally changing careers, going from business into healthcare? It's terrifying, but usually something that is super scary is really, you know, having a family, really worthwhile. It's super scary. And then once it happens, it was worthwhile. One of the things Mary and I are going to talk about in this Lessons in Leadership series as well that we have not touched on, if through all the years we've been talking, we change our curriculum in our seminars and workshops. And one of the areas I really like is that leadership in life, mm -hmm. being good at it, not average, but good, right. also means balancing. You know what? The term work-life balance never works for me mm -hmm. because there is no balance. Right. I like to use the term, you ever hear me say this, work-life integration. Integration. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. The difference is if you say work-life balance, that would mean that, all right, if you have a 40-hour work week, 20 is going to be for work and 20 is going to be for life. Number one, life isn't linear. It's not easy to say, oh, today I'm just going to work eight hours. It's well, not maybe a math equation. It's not a math <laughs> equation. Things are going to happen in work and in life. So to say that it's balance is not going to work. But integration, it's bringing them together, realizing that there can be overflow from one to the other. And one other quick thing, not just in leadership, but in life. I was joking a little bit about using this button before, but how often have you had to say or couldn't say or wanted to say and didn't say, Sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. I apologize. It's Why terrifying. Why is it so hard? It's so scary. To it say is. Because you are admitting that you did something wrong. If you say that, hey, I'm sorry, Steve. I admit it, I'm not perfect. Okay. Exactly. I screwed up. Yeah. Where is the... The downside is in not admitting it. I agree. But for many people, including myself 15 years ago, I hated to say that I was sorry because it's acknowledging, mm. oh, my gosh, I'm not perfect. And I made a Join mistake. Join the club. I Join know. The... All right, Brian. Brian Brodeur is giving us this signal. I wonder what this means, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to use my imagination and say yes. So we'll that's say all sorry. the time we have for Lessons in Leadership. What? You can see the sign, Steve Alvarez, Lessons in Leadership with my great colleague, Mary Gamba. And again, it does take a team because we would not be here. I would not be doing what I'm doing if it weren't for her. And we would not be here if it weren't for Brian and his team. So, Mary, that's it. That's folk, it. Tell folks they'll yep. see us next week. See us next week, absolutely. Hear us next week. Hear us, see us. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. Yep. Check you out next time, folks. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Hackensack Meridian Health, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. The law firm of Gibbons PC. NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters. Your future is in our building. International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Fedway Associates. And by Suez, water solutions to meet tomorrow's environmental challenges. Promotional support provided by NJ Advance Media. And by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the NJTV, Agnes Ferris Studio in beautiful Newark, New Jersey. That's right. He's here. He is John Bramnick. He's the Assembly Republican leader um, in the 21st Legislative District. Let me ask you this. All the attention on you, a lot of money in your race, 
Democrats coming at you on one end, right-wing Republicans coming at you on the other end. Some people said it was going to be over for John Bramnick. What happened? I think just common sense prevailed. You know, they knew me in the district. They know I'm not crazy. I'm not an extremist. And I think in today's world, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody who's, in my judgment, just a moderate, reasonable, decent human being. Tough to find in politics today. And also, you're reelected as a Republican assembly leader. We should clarify that as well. In the minority party. Curious about this. A lot of the names thrown around in your district. How important was the influence of President Trump in your election? Uh, well, it didn't play a big role this time. Murphy, Governor Murphy actually played a big role. When he said... He wasn't on the ballot. No, no, big role. Because he went out and he said, if taxes are your main issue, New Jersey's not for you. Now, is, do you want to send him two more votes? And I think people said, you know, I think I like balance in Trenton. I don't think Governor Murphy's tax policy needs two more votes. I think that played much larger than Trump. Trump is not popular in my district. And by the way, if you check out our previous interviews with Assemblyman Bradnick, you'll hear the very candid comments that he's made about the president, and particularly about and, tone and demeanor. And, and, and I'll continue to say it, and I'm not afraid. And actually, they threatened me that if I didn't regret what I said about the president, they would run against me from the right. I said, bring it on. That's exactly what I said Why are here. so many of your colleagues, I'll come back to Murphy in a second, why are so many of your colleagues in the Republican Party, particularly in Congress, look, we're doing this program in the middle of November. We know what's going on. This will be seen after that. Why are so many of your congressional Republican colleagues appear to be so reluctant to say anything negative, question anything about President Trump? Because of what happened to me. Uh, two people said they were the Trump Republicans, and they ran in a general election. Meaning you weren't the real Republican, Trump well, Republican. Well, you're asking me why the Congress, Republican Congress people will not speak out? It's because so-called, these so-called right-wing people run against you. But I was speaking out against, he called people names, he called Republican scum, he called John McCain a, a loser. Let me tell you, that has nothing to do with politics. That's basic De decency. And I called it out and I'd do it again. I'm not, I'm not afraid to call out somebody in my party when they're talking about that. I never say anything about 3% unemployment, which I like. So my point You're is... You're not talking about Trump's policy so much. It's his tone and demeanor. Don't call people names. I learned that in third grade in Cedarbrook School in Plainfield, New Jersey. Pretty simple, right? Don't do it. And if you're afraid to call somebody out when they're calling people names, I got a problem with you. So the Murphy piece. I interviewed... Um... Governor Murphy, we'll have him here in this studio, but I interviewed him on the air, and uh, I was uh, radio uh, hosting at uh, AM 970, which you know well, uh, <laughs> subbing for our friend Joe, Joe Piscopo. Piscopo. And the governor was good enough to join us, and I asked him about that quote, in which I believe, I'm going to get this right, he said, if taxes are the issue or one of the main issues uh, then for you, then maybe New Jersey's not the state for you. Do I have that right? Well, it's close enough, but the only important issue here is you could say, you know, I'm going to do what I can about taxes. Don't act like, well, if taxes are your issue, I'm, you, you should move. What you should say is, listen, I understand taxes. He didn't say you should move. He said maybe New Jersey's not the state for How you. How about saying I'm going to do what I can to control taxes? Why don't you say that? Because I'll tell you what he said to me in that radio program, which I'm confident he'll say here yeah. because he hasn't changed his view. He said, look, Steve, I don't want to raise taxes, but I want fair taxes. I want taxes that are fair in New Jersey. So say and those that. who have more, a million dollars or more in making... Every dollar over a million dollars, we're going to raise it, your taxes, so that we can fund other programs like universal pre-K and other initiatives. You say? I say that's what he should have said. He should have talked about the millionaire's tax. It's always polled well. Right. Don't say New Jersey's not the place for you. I've spoken to working people who go like this. Wait a minute, I've been here my whole life. It's not the place for me. You know, people don't hear exactly what you say. They hear what they hear. So what I'm saying is if he had said what Steve Adubato just said, we wouldn't have had a great issue against him. Now we do. Where do you think the governor is at the midpoint of his four-year term? What has he done well, and where has... Well, you already made it clear where you no, think he hasn't no. done well on a tax he's issue, but go ahead. He's done well because he's very civil. He re returns everybody's messages. He's like you that way. He's respectful with he's other people. He's a nice guy. He was in my house. Uh, you know, really nice guy. The problem is he's not talking to his own party. He says he's not transactional. Really? Well, you're now the governor, and you're trying to get something done. You have to negotiate at least with your own party. He's not even talking to his own party. He has a poor relationship with the leadership on the Democratic side. You're talking about he, Steve Sweeney in particular? And Senate I don't think President. it's great with Coughlin anymore either. The assembly I mean, speaker? He, especially when the governor intervened into assembly elections. He put his face on TV through his new direction pack 
in the middle of our election. I loved it. I don't think Craig Coughlin loved it. The point is this. You have to be transactional. That's what politics is. He's in a progressive lane. He wants to do what he wants to do. He's making no friends. And you don't need friends. At least you need partners. Chris Christie, what did he do? Immediately started dealing with Steve Sweeney, got stuff done. You know, it's interesting. People call themselves Democrats and Republicans, but there are a lot of different versions of that, right, Chuck? You, of course. And you're there are Democrats moderate. I like and Republicans I like and Republicans I don't like and, and Democrats I don't like. Do you see, if we're looking at 2020, and I'm not big on prognostication and predicting elections, but in your view, has the Republican Party, because we had Governor Christy Whitman in here earlier today and said, she's a lifelong Republican. She doesn't relate to President Trump. No. You're a lifelong <laughs> Republican. Yeah, yeah, she's a lifelong, you're a lifelong Republican. You don't relate to him on certain issues. Right. And on, uh, excuse me, on tone and demeanor. Is the Republican Party, John Bramnick, at this point, simply the Trump Party? Absolutely not. In New it's Jersey, not. it's not. Okay, is New Jersey, if someone like you gets elected, you have other states across this nation where Republicans are locked shoulder to shoulder with the president, will not deviate at all, meaning they believe the Republican Party is the Trump Party. Is New Jersey that out of sync with the rest of the nation? Uh, I would say with respect to Republicans, yeah, I think we're a different brand of Republicans. I think we're a more moderate group than certain states that are 100 percent with Donald Trump. Uh, I think we agree on certain issues and disagree. But I think, obviously, Republicans in New Jersey generally tend to be more moderate. I've been at national conventions, and I think we're a little, little bit to the left of some of the Republicans. New Jersey is. General, but you saw Tom Kane Sr., yes. Chris, Chris Christie. He didn't run as a right wing. Actually, Steve Lonigan ran against him because he was too moderate. Uh, Tom Kane Sr., uh, he was an environmental champion. He was in, about inclusion. So I don't think that's what you're hearing through some mm. Republicans nationally. John Bramack, who is a Republican assembly leader, let me ask you your top three issues in 2020 for the state legislature to deal with are? One, taxes. We've got a cap spending. Clearly, there should be a 2 percent cap. A <clears> second, explain that. 2 percent well, cap. Well, right now, every town can't raise their budgets by more than 2 percent. State of New Jersey goes by, up by 11 percent in two years. We should be capped at 2 percent also. If that were to happen, how would you make pension payments into the public employee pension fund? How would you fund roads, bridges? How would you fund New Jersey transit? How would you do the things that everyone argues, universal pre-K, other things? How would you do that if there's a 2 percent cap? How, how do towns do it? Same issue. You have to sit down and you have to figure out what your priorities are, but you can't keep taxing people out of the state. Next, this affordable housing issue is no longer an affordable housing issue. It's court-imposed high-density housing, a complete, utter mess, putting pressure on schools, putting pressure on infrastructure, and raising property Those taxes. Those who are advocates, excuse me, if some of them argue they're just trying to create affordable housing. It's community. up to the and legislature. Why would you turn that over to the courts? Because it's the courts step in when they say the legislature hasn't acted. Exactly. And that's why the legislature should take on the issue and take care of it. Why are, they def why are the Democrats in the legislature deferring to the courts? Why do you think? Well, because it's too dangerous. It's What's a hot dangerous about it? What's dangerous? <clears throat> the Republican, I'm sorry, the Democratic legislators from suburban districts are afraid of the issue. They are. You bet. It's a dangerous issue. <sighs> and third, it's always been my, 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 my third issue has always been uh, doing a demeanor in Trenton that we talk to each other uh, in a way that we can get some compromise of bipartisan. If you don't do that, you mm -hmm. can't get anything done. By the way, before I let you out, how's your comedy career going? Good. Comedy's <laughs> good. I got some new material, actually, after this election, because they did $250,000 against me on TV. Yeah. That gave me all kinds of material, so I'll be at the Golden Nugget November 20th. Yeah, but you're not Headline. a full-time comedian. I'm gonna, you're a lawyer, <laughs> you're a legislator, <laughs> and you're part-time. Do, do the state senator joke real quick. Well, a state senator was pulled over by a trooper, and the trooper said, uh, license registration, the state senator, do you know who I am? And the trooper called down to headquarters and said, I got a guy here who doesn't know who he is. <laughs> you write this stuff yourself? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I steal it. The funniest lawyer in New Jersey is also the Assembly Republican leader. John, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. All the best to you and your you family. Bet. Thanks. Stay with us right back <laughs> after this. Doesn't know who he is. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. This is uh, State Senator Patrick Dignan, who is the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. Good to see you, Senator. Thanks for having me. How are we doing with New Jersey Transit? I just figured I'd jump I mean, right into it. I mean, it. I, know it's, I know it's easy to pile I'm on. I'm not making jokes. I'm just asking. <laughs> it's easy to pile on, Steve. Not... 
And don't talk about how long it took no, you to I get just, here. I heard your train was late today. <laughs> no, but seriously, what do you think, I don't want to say the problem, the primary problems are with New Jersey Transit? Well, let's be perfectly honest, neglect. I mean, it had uh, at least four years of total neglect. Now, no uh, uh, training classes for engineers, uh, diverting the money from the turnpike to for day-to-day uh, -day operations. I mean, n positive traction control, positive train control hadn't even begun. I mean, the, for, in, in full disclosure, the governor, the commissioner, the director were really let, left with a you-know-what problem when they came in. It sounds like you're putting this on the Christie administration. Isn't that too easy, respectfully, Senator? Well, <laughs> no, but, but do you really believe that that is the primary cause of where we are right now? Yes. With, with trains that are delayed, canceled, no communication or terrible communication, forget about the bus side. I mean, seriously, you're putting it all on Christie? Okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's first of all, about 500,000 people a day take New Jersey, the buses and the trains. Right. We have the unique situation of a significant, probably more than half our population, works either in New York or uh, uh, Pennsylvania or yep. Philadelphia. So you have such a demand on the structure. We have the situation with the tunnel. You and I both know, they're talking about the one seat. They can't even uh, uh, approve any more one seats because there's no capacity in the tunnel. If Chris Christie, in, in fairness, and I like Chris Christie. Because it was against the tunnel, the no, arc tunnel? If the arc tunnel, it'd be done right well, now. What would it be? It'd be done. Ten years. It'd be, no. no, no, no. It was ten. But it was eight. They had okay. actually started acquiring the property when Chris. What would Christie, be what would be in place right now if Christie hadn't done the York Tunnel? Be done. And or, what would or that have to do that? with transportation? Well, it have to do with trains getting into New York City. I mean, and and the one seat and all the other issues. I mean, is it a problem? Is it something that we need? I mean, I, I salute the Senate President and. Uh, the speaker for uh, having independent committees to let's get on this and let's all work together to get it done. Is it is it a problem? Is it something that needs attention? Is it something that needs different points of view? Absolutely positive. So, by the way, let's be clear. There's a Senate Select Committee. Is that what Correct. it is? And I want to be clear on this. It is a committee that is established to do what? To basically listen to the riders. In fact, our first hearing is going to be uh, tomorrow night. In, We're in actually Hobart. taping on November 12th. This will okay, be seen okay. after that. Go okay, ahead. okay. And really basically get input from folks. Uh, you know, let's say tomorrow, let's say you and I took over New Jersey Transit tomorrow, and we decided we wanted to purchase 500 more trains and 300 more buses. It would take four or five years to get them, to get them delivered. You know, now the issue is with electric. Should we go electric or shouldn't we go electric with the school buses and, and the other buses? Of course we should. But they aren't even manufacturing them quickly enough. Is it a problem? Is it unacceptable? Yes, but it's not something that you just put a magic wand over. But, Senator, what about the whole question of the number of conductors, mm -hmm. right? Is it conductors that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. They're woefully short. What, did everyone quit all at once? Well, that's what I'm saying. This, this, is, this, is a, this is a crisis that has been a piling up, I and mean, it's actually engineers. We both oh, so engineers. I'm sorry. They're close en enough. Engineers. <laughs> so the, the, we don't have enough engineers, mm -hmm. trained engineers. And I know that, because NJTV News, check this out, our colleagues here did a great story on a graduating class. So there are how many, what, 20 or so? Uh, at the end of this year, there'll be 40 more, okay. and hopefully by the end of next year, I think the number is 120. Where does that leave us? It leaves a big problem, because l last year at this very date when we had that snow event, the trains were delayed. The, en the uh, uh, engineers can only work so many hours because of safety precautions. Right. So the next day, a disproportion of, um, of engineers couldn't even come to work. They were prohibited from coming to work because of the safety issue. So we had chaos for several days in a row. It's, it's, it, is, it is a complication that you clearly we wish we could address in a second, but, but it's going to take time. But it's time. interesting, Senator. You're the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, but all the you discussion so far... <laughs> well, no, but this is... The, but the entire discussion with me, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm pretty confident with others, is about New Jersey Transit. But to be head of the Transportation Committee in the Senate means roads, bridges, everything, right? Correct. What are we dealing with in, ter in terms of the sexy word infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Bridges. Mm -hmm credible account as to how many of our bridges are either in disrepair, got a problem with, dangerous on, you pick your adjective. Where are we with them? They are right now in the process of evaluating those, and, and they're actually using the, the uh, Transportation Trust Fund money. One of the priorities is to, to for bridges. I mean, again, let's, let's just look at a real-life situation. Sure. Let's go back to trains for a second. I was at an event in North Brunswick the other day where 
the state is putting $50 million into developing a train station in North Brunswick. We're do talking about doing the same thing in Canada. We're talking about the light rail. I mean, there's so many various diverse issues that are going on. But I, I, I think the main thing you're saying, why are we having the hearings? I think the main thing is let's identify priorities and it's going to take money and we got to direct the money towards it. In fairness, 75 million was previously diverted from the Turnpike Authority. That is no longer being done. We put an extra $50 million in last year's budget for it to address transportation issues. But it's going to take time. I, I mean, I wish there was a so, magic formula. So we're actually today, as we're taping here at NJTV Studios, um, we're going to have the head of New Jersey Transit, Kevin Corbett, going to be talking to us. Right. Is his job right now in this particular, at this time, is it virtually impossible? No. Nothing's impossible. Okay, in terms of seeing tangible solutions, tangible improvements, I think this is what I hear you saying. Not anytime soon, because this is a long time coming. It's going to be a long time turning this around. That's what I'm hearing. Well, but, you know, I, I guess is the last half full or half empty. I mean, a lot has been accomplished. I mean, the positive train control, uh, getting the, the one seat back in place with the Westfield line, et cetera, the Princeton line, getting Atlantic City straightened up. I mean, it's the, uh, improving the New Brunswick train station, a whole bunch of other train stations. Elizabeth with, with the first one where we're actually going to do the, the project the design and work at the same time. So there actually has been progress, but it's frustrating. Let me ask you this uh, for the chat here. Do you foresee the folks in New Jersey Transit, the board, because I believe it's the board that does right. this, potentially calling for a fair increase this summer? Absolutely no idea. I, I, but, it, but in all, and, and would here's, you be against it? Here's my theory. If you said to the average commuter, you're going to pay an extra buck each way to go into the city or whatever, and it's going to be used and give tangible, real uh, results. With Here's, deadlines? With deadlines. I think they'd go along with it. With but, deadlines? With deadlines. As opposed to open-ended, one exactly. day it's, we're going to try to be better. That's not go. good enough. Exactly. And I've always believed that. I've always believed that if the citizens know where the money is going, like the Transportation Trust Fund, the gas yes. tax. I ran the year with the gas tax. Everybody said, my God, you're Raising voted. the gas yes. tax. Everybody said, you're, Pat, you're, you kiss your office goodbye. People understood what it was being used for. I won by a bigger majority than the year before. I've been listening to Senator Patrick Dignan, who is the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. And uh, we look forward to having you back, Senator. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Anytime. Good Keep job. up the good work. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. Thank you. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. There she is, Zakia Smith Ellis, Secretary of Higher Education in the state of New Jersey. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Uh, you've joined us many times. I want to jump right into a topic yeah. that's important higher education and economic success. What's the correlation? Why does it matter? Well, we know that students who graduate from college are more likely to get jobs, keep jobs. And it's a key part of New Jersey's economic success. Here, more than in other states, you have to have something beyond high school to really be able to be successful. A lot of employers are now asking for that. So we know that by 2025, something like 65% of new jobs are going to require some kind of post-secondary credential. There's an initiative that we talked about a little bit last time. It is called Where Our Opportunity Meets Innovation. Is that the core of it? a student-centered division for higher education? Because there are five components of yeah. it. Break it down for us. Yeah, so there's, um, that's our state plan for higher education. We need to figure out how does higher education help uh, students get into the real economy? How mm. does it help prepare them for success? And how are students contributing to the economic fabric of the state of New Jersey? The governor likes to call it connecting higher ed to the real economy, but I just call it you know good uh, work with students and making sure that students are successful. Five components to that plan. First is making sure that they have a strong transition from uh, high school to college. Not always easy. Yeah, not always easy. The next is affordability, which even if you're prepared, you got to be able to pay for it, which is not easy either. Without massive student debt. Without on the massive back end. student debt, we don't want students to have that burden of as much debt as they've had in the past. And then, how do you make sure that they're successful? So you might take on the debt, but if you take on the debt, you want to know that you're going to graduate, and you're going to graduate with a credential that's going to help you in your future. Um, and sometimes you need support to do that, so safe and supportive learning environments. We want students to be safe when they're on campus. And the last piece is about research, innovation, and talent, really making sure that it's not just about the students being successful um, in graduating, but what are they learning when they're there? Are they getting the kind of research opportunities that we know are really important in an area like New Jersey? You know, I don't know if I said this to you last time, but we've had um, 
some folks on, um, particularly Gary Vee. Mm -hmm. Have you heard Gary mm -hmm. Vee? Mm -hmm. Gary Vee is an yes. interesting motivational speaker. Yeah. And um, our producers and those who know our show remember the time he was with us. We had a very spirited debate and discussion about you saying it's overrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. High res is overrated. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm a successful entrepreneur. College did not do it. You don't need it. You don't take that, all that money, whether it's 50 grand, 100 grand, right. 200 grand, whatever it is. Start a business, mm -hmm. you say. Well, I say he is an exceptional person, and that's fantastic, but he's the exception and not the rule. So I can't tell you, I can't guarantee you that if you go to college, definitely, absolutely, you'll never have any struggles in no life. No can guarantee anyone anything. Exactly. No one can get, but I can tell you I would bet money on it. If you don't go to college, it's going to be a lot harder for you to have that success in life. So when, I t when you talk about the two options, should you go or should you not go, you know, for every one in a million, there may be that Bill Gates, that Gary Vee, that person that drops out and makes it well. But I can tell you, if you're a steward in Newark Public Schools right now, that your best bet is to go to college rather than to not go. You really believe that? I, do, I know it to be What's true. What's it done for you? Uh, it's been um, wonderful in my life. I mean, um, I'm a third generation college graduate, but my grandmother went to college in the 1950s as an African-American woman in South Carolina. Wow. Back before there was a Higher Education wow. Act, back before there were student loans. <laughs> back Why before, did she? <laughs> she Why? did that because she was talented and because back then, you know, you wanted, she wanted to be a teacher. And if you wanted to be a teacher, you had to have a college degree. Right. And so that's what she did. And so I know that it allowed her a pathway out of poverty. And it's done that for millions and millions of other people. We know that from the data. I don't just know it from personal experience but the data bears it out. If you have a college degree, you are much less likely to fall into poverty you and much more likely to get a job that sustains you with a family sustaining wage. It's a good bet. It's a great bet. You know, the other thing I struggle with, because, again, not a new issue, mm -hmm. but keeping New Jersey's best, mm -hmm. brightest, hardest working students yep. mm -hmm. in the state, yeah. not easy. It's not easy, and it's been a long-term issue. Yes. You go back and you look in the data, and it's been something that New Jersey struggled with for some time. Um, and we're trying to figure out, part of one of the working groups is trying to think about why is that, what can we do? We're working with the president's counsel, Joel Bloom, and... Yeah, Joel Bloom yeah. over at the New Jersey Institute at of Technology. New NJIT, yeah, we're working yep. with him and the whole group there to think about um, how can we market the state better for students so they can know about the options for going to college here that are really powerful. Do you, do you think what it's about, and we have a, a couple of kids in high school right now, and, mm -hmm. and I see, because I will talk about a lot of New Jersey schools, mm -hmm. And I could see the draw mm -hmm. for them. I could see the attraction, the whole idea of going out of state. Yeah. H how do you deal with the whole question of the college experience, having a great mm -hmm. college experience here yeah. at home? Oh. Well, there's just, so I have a cousin that's um, two that are college age right now. And what do you thinking say about them? them. Well, I tell, oh, I tell them all the time. And they'll, if they watch this, they'll know. Um, and they'll watch it because I'll tell them they'll watch it. I'll text it to them. But I say there's a lot of great colleges here that's that you right. just may not know about. So a lot of times we look, you're from a, you know, a smaller state, and you say, I don't want to be at home. But if you're from Cherry Hill, why not go up to Montclair? <laughs> that's going to feel right. like a world away. Um, if you're from you know, Newark, why not go down to Rowan in Glassboro or go to Atlantic City at Stockton? You've got a great new campus there. So there's a lot of differences That's going that away. people... That, it's really going away. It's outside of your comfort zone. And sometimes I just think you don't... We don't think about it like that. Um, but there's such a variety of colleges and universities here that sometimes we don't And realize. a lot of it's marketing and branding? I think some of it is marketing and branding. I think that a lot of other... Now, New Jersey's high schools are great. So we've got the number one school... Uh, system in the nation. That's right. Um, and so we have a lot of recruiters from other colleges from other states that come here to pick off our students. And they do a lot of marketing for our high school students. So they're very sought after. Zakia Smith Ellis is the Secretary of Higher Education in the state of New Jersey. I want to thank you mm -hmm. for joining us. Yeah. We're smarter because you were here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Stay right there. I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Hackensack Meridian Health, PSE and G, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Fedway Associates, Suez, and by these public spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State, and by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NJ Advance Media and by ROINJ. What is your child's dream for the future? Doctor? Teacher? Architect? Whatever they aspire to be, a college education may realize those dreams and NJ Best can help. It's the college savings plan specifically designed for New Jersey families. 
Start saving today with as little as $25, because now is the time to invest in their future. To learn about NJ Best 529 College Savings Plan, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the Investor Handbook available at njbest.com.